Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Let's just get into our conversation today. I've got a special guest, Roy Speckhardt, joining me. He is the executive director of the American Humanist Association. He's also written uh, several books, including Creating Change Through Humanism and his most recent offering, Justice-Centered Humanism, How and Why to Engage in Public Policy for Good, or Humanism in Practice. I got a reason for this, because uh, we talk about atheism so much, right? What we don't believe in. We don't believe in a God. We don't believe in a supernatural deity out there, blah, blah, blah. And I'm interested uh, this week in what we do believe in. Yeah, what am I about? What do I think? What are my values? And how do we fix the mess that is the world we live in? And I think justice-centered humanism in that context is a hugely compelling subject. That's what I want to talk about today with the author of the new book, Roy Speckhart. Great to have you. Thanks for coming. Happy to be on. Thank you. So uh, you have been a public figure. You've been on Good Morning America. You've been on NPR, CNN, Fox News. What's that like? What's it like well, appearing as a humanist on Fox News, Roy? It's interesting. Uh, it's more embattled, even on the other networks as well. I know on CNN, Headline News, I was across from uh, the head of the Catholic League, Bill Donahue, who tried to equate humanism with cannibalism, um, and the host was, was actually helping. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm sorry, you just, that's a new one. Like, I've heard a lot, of, I've heard baby eating, and maybe that does qualify as cannibalism. <laughs> and we love humanism so much, apparently he thinks we're going to eat them. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, but Fox News, of course, they can be tricky. I know... Um, Megyn Kelly, when she was there, was a pretty tough character to be up against. But generally speaking, they're, they're interested in hearing our perspective, because as much as Fox News is uh, twisting reality often and presenting the right, they also want to present culture war issues. And so having humanists on from time to time and atheists is something they like. <laughs> I think it is healthy. You know, some people ask, why would anyone ever agree to be interviewed? I understand the protest, because... I'm convinced the Sean Hannity's aren't interested in what a humanist guest or a secular atheist guest or even a democratic guest might have to say. I think they become more of an excuse for the host to grandstand. But I guess mm -hmm. the hope is, is that you're reaching in some way the audience. Maybe there will be a crack in the door. Yeah, I think that that happens. I mean, we know folks across political spectrum do end up watching Fox News whether they like it or not, sometimes it's just on in some particular venue they're in and they're watching it and getting to see that there's somebody standing up for the other point of view, I think is important. You're a sociologist. Right, yes. A study of the culture in that way, you look around at the United States in 2021, forgive the broad question, but what's going on in your mind these days? Wow, so many things. I know, it's, <laughs> forgive me, I just... I figure you yeah. would know where your area of focus and interest is. I just yeah. cast a wide net and you can decide where to start. During a Congressional Free Thought Caucus meeting, we had Daniel Dennett as a guest. And one of the things that he observed was that there is a level of change that's going on that hasn't been seen in millennia. That this is similar to the pre-Cambrian age when eyesight was developed and um, people were able to see their prey and find it or see their predator and run from it. He feels that the 
ubiquitousness of the internet and information today provides a, a transparency that has never been there before, but also at the same time, a way to distort that reality and to tunnel vision ourselves into our own silos. And so it's a, it's a very significant time of change and transition that we're seeing. And um, it's fascinating, but also a little scary sometimes. I mean, when you look at the internet, <laughs> do you have that conversation about the algorithms that place us into tiny boxes with affirming information, you know, things that right. I already think are being fed to me, which validates and reinforces my walls. I may not necessarily be introduced in a healthy way to contradicting ideas. Definitely. And I also think that this is part of the core of our growth of our movement. I mean, a lot of people have pegged the growth of atheism and non-religious folks across the United States and the world to particular authors or particular approaches by organizations and things like that. But I think a lot of it really does have to do with this expanded access to information. I know when I was growing up, you know, the idea that you could be an atheist in my little Catholic Jewish town upstate New York, it just wasn't on the table as an option. But kids growing up today, you just can't miss it. It's there. It's everywhere. And we realize that it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Roy, you know, we're talking like our parents. I remember back when we had only had the Dewey Decimal System and, <laughs> and Microfish, and we had to drive to the library and make Xerox copies of everything. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> a blessing and a curse. I'm amazed at how much I can discover. I mean, genuinely discover from reputable right. resources. We talk about the uh, resources that are out there online at the fingertip, but you're right. There's a dark side. You know, I look at uh, the agents of misinformation. I guess Marjorie Taylor Greene and her ilk maybe really are that delusional, but but we see they just had a rally in my home city of Tulsa, Oklahoma. This was uh, not long ago. It was that uh, freaking QAnon rally. I mean, thousands oh, right. of people, right, with Lynn Wood on yeah. stage and doing the Q symbol. And a Pew survey just came out saying last week, I believe, saying that um, 15% of the country believe the QAnon theory that the country is being led by pedophiles who are trying to advocate for some special far left agenda that makes no sense whatsoever. The fact that that many millions of people have signed on to something like that, it really does give one pause. How do we get accurate information out to the broad populace so that we can have an informed voter group and a formed group that's thinking about how we can make this country and the world a little bit better. That's a challenge that I think we're up against. Does the data even matter? I mean, if I go to a and honor and I'm like, well, no, there aren't magnets in the vaccines or radio trackers <laughs> or, you know, Fauci and Bill Gates didn't room together at Cornell to come up with an end of the world kind of a scenario. I mean, if I go and I'm like, well, this, here's the data. Quite often, people don't seem to change their mind based on improving right. data. We see this all the time in my circle. I'm an ex-evangelical, so uh -huh. I grab a Bible, I show up, and I'm like, well, look, here, 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 and here, and I'm expecting that they will join me in rationality, and we will hold hands, and there will be light from the sky, and harps, and confetti, and kumbaya. We will all enter the age of reason together, and instead, they just seem to reinforce and double down. Well, I think that there are a segment of society where trying to change those minds really is um, banging your head against the wall. It's similar. It goes back to George Lakoff in ideas about framing. You know, if you have a strong enough frame of thinking that suggests that only truth comes from the Bible, only truth comes from these kind of wacky other sources, then anything that you hear or anything that you see that doesn't fit that frame, you see as in league with the devil or some other kind of problem. And so, there isn't an easy way to reach folks that are that far gone. Uh, not, not that they might never move to a more middle ground and then be approachable later in life, but right now, I think it's better to focus on the middle folks, the folks who haven't quite solidified their beliefs so strongly that they're not open to conversation. I think one of the more alarming things that I just never realized, I never realized so many people in this country would respond to authoritarianism. And, you know, being an ex-evangelical I see my former faith as it's an authoritarian religion, right? You've got a, sure. a main icon who you follow. You are allegiant to at all cost. Even blind faith is lauded. And we see then, or we are primed to see savior figures, and we rally 
turn off reasoning centers. We turn off sometimes our moral centers and decide that allegiance, loyalty is number one. When I see the last four years with Donald Trump, all he had to do was wave a Bible, pander to the evangelicals. He knows shit about the Bible. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think he knows anything. He doesn't care about religion. His own personal attorney said he didn't. He's not a Christian, but he knows the power of weaponizing Christianity. And I thought, well, okay, fine. People will see right through it. And instead, there's a huge swath of people that seem to have embraced the authoritarian states. I agree. I have seen that embracement of authoritarianism that is scary and, um, you know, has had me worrying about drifting toward fascism, frankly. Mm. Um, And I know that's a scary word that sex seems like it's not possible, but you know, I think it was possible. <laughs> yeah, like you see how it can happen all of a sudden. Yeah, you you're like see. theocracy with a right. savior figure at the cornerstone position. I, I never thought we'd get there. You know, I, I we're used to religious or evangelical politicians, but this authoritarian model, it just blew my mind. No, I think that there is a tendency toward um, toward that among some folks who feel that they're lost or they're struggling and and the world is, you know, has a lot of problems going on these days, as we know, with the, the pandemic and everything else. And so they latch on to authority sometimes. But I, I think that there are other problems that we're facing as humanists, as people who are committed to the separation of church and state in this country today. Even though Trump's no longer in office, we have a situation in the courts that I think everyone recognizes is problematic on the, on the left and the middle. But I think people don't realize how deeply problematic it is. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, how church-state separation issues and uh, civil rights issues are handled in Canada, but a few years back, they decided that, you know, there's often conflicts between uh, a religious person's religious freedom and their protection of LGBTQ rights. We see that all the time in the United States, but also on other issues, white supremacy, all kinds of things. And um, in Canada, they just said, okay, religious rights come second, (laughs) all your civil rights come first done. And so it's very simple. <laughs> and, um, and they're able to adjudicate these things in a relatively fair way that's universal. In the United States, we are very, very close to saying religious rights come first, and that every other right comes second. And that is going to be a very scary time if we fall all the way into that. Speaking here with Roy Speckhart, he is the executive director of the American Humanist Association. You've used the word atheist in our conversation just a few minutes ago. You don't have to be an atheist to be a humanist. Would you agree with that? Um, I'd agree with that. Uh, I think you could be an agnostic or maybe even a deist or a pantheist, somebody who does not place their allegiance and reliance on knowledge and the world and the outcomes on supernatural beings, including gods. That's a humanist. If you step over that line and you say, well, you know, if I just pray for this, I'll, I'll be able to get to a better place or the information that I've received from revelation or ancient texts are valuable, not sources of knowledge, that's outside of the bounds of humanism. So it's not, it's not unrelated to the question of theism, uh, but um, you don't have to identify as an atheist to be humanist. But you guys do a lot of interfaith work. I mean, you've locked arms with some people of faith who still want to protect the state church line, right? Definitely. I think that, you know, we're a minority in this country. We are growing rapidly and becoming quite a significant minority, the uh, non-religious, non-theist crowd, but we are still a minority. And if we want to get stuff done, we need to build a majority of people who agree with us on the issues that matter. And there are lots of progressive religious folks that do agree with us on church-state separation issues, on um, rights for others, on, on rights for atheists and humanists even. I was looking at some of the data from Pew and... Uh Ryan Burge and some other stuff that had been posted about, especially the 30 and under crowd. They're not engaged with religion or the church, and they're kind of not interested. And part of me, you know, my heart leapt for a moment, and then I'm a little concerned about kind of this apatheism, because for a lot of people, certainly not all, I'm not making a blanket statement, but for a lot of people who are disconnected with religion, they also seem to be a little bit disconnected from state church issues. And perhaps the crisis happening around us that is fueled by the theocrats who have uh, weaponized the name of God for power. Right. Do you worry that uh, there is a disengagement at all? I do worry about a disengagement from community. One of the reasons I do worry about that, not just for political reasons, but just individual healthy happiness issues as well. Because we've seen studies, especially those of us who've been in the atheist humanist movement for a long time, that say, you know, every, every 
few weeks nearly, you see something in the news saying, if you're religious, you're bound to be more successful or happy. And then you look at the study a little closer and you realize what they're comparing is people who attend services to people who don't attend services. And what they're really comparing is people who have community connection versus those who have no community connection. And of course, community connections do give us the uh, means of support when things are difficult, ways to have a step up among above others. It's, it's beneficial for a lot of us. And I guess what I'm worried about, again, a little bit of the age of internet piece, is that during this time, we may not have that kind of robust network that you get in community organizations, be they religious or non-religious, that we need as human beings. The church is amazing at community. Yeah. Oh, they're just right. so good at it. It's, I think, one of the reasons that uh, our Sunday assemblies or whatever you know we've been doing often will adopt the church model. You know, come in, exactly. we have special music, and here's some agendas, and then we have an inspirational speaker because you know, their model is actually not bad. But then we get into the herding cats problem because you know here well, I think we're both at a point position in atheist humanist conversations and. We struggle. I think we have struggled with providing a net for people to fall in who are leaving religious communities. I mean, I'm not sure how we get over that hump. There's so many reasons, I think, that uh, the formerly religious or the non-religious, they're distrustful of communities right. revolving around what we do. I don't even know how to phrase the question, Roy, but tell me what you think, <laughs> yeah. man. No, I, I, I hear you. I've done talks, hundreds of talks around the country to different groups, and you know, I, and one of the questions I've asked a lot of groups is whether they came from religion or not, and how many, if for some reason they didn't come from a particular religious tradition, were their parents religious, were their grandparents religious? There are so few generational non-theists out there, mm. um, even in our own community. And so I think that people have left religion, and there's a lot of harm in religion, let's face it, uh, especially if you're a progressive individual, if you're LGBTQ, if you're a person of color, there's so many things to have problems with religion. And so leaving that, ex having experienced that harm, it's hard to jump into a community that looks in any way like religion. And so I think that is a real challenge for us to overcome. I think it may be a special situation for our generation, however, because there are so many more people who are growing up without religion and who are non-religious. As you mentioned earlier about the young folks who are, you know, a third of whom are non-religious in college, entering college. And then, of course, if you look at any study, the longer you're in college, the less religious you are. So we're going to have like half of the population non-religious before we know it, uh, among young folks at least. And then we're going to see the following generation that were raised by parents who were not in religion it's not a big deal to be in a community. And so, the, but the, how are we going to make it from here to there? I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I, this but, sounds uh, really dark, but I heard somebody say that, you know, there, a couple of generations are just going to have to die off. Like, <laughs> and that's a little bit pessimistic. You know, I'm hoping that, you know, all right, we don't need all the people with bad ideas in this way, or a, a great many of them, the majority to pass away of old age peacefully in their sleep or whatever for us to achieve <laughs> positive change. But I understand the spirit of what they're saying, right? Because yeah. many of them are dragging in antiquated ideas and those ideas vote and they influence cultures, et cetera. Indeed. You have written a book called Creating Change Through Humanism. What kind of change? How do you define humanism? I mean, give me the Cliffs notes, man. <laughs> well, uh, humanism is the not so radical idea that you can be good without a God. But it's a little more than that, because folks sometimes are, are, are equate us with anti theists, people who, which, you know, some of us and even, even most of us might feel that way once in a while. <laughs> yeah. But anti theism doesn't define what humanism is, even if we are that way once in a while, or some of us focus more on it. Religious humanism isn't part of what defines humanism, even though some people might view their humanism as a religion of sorts. But it's hard to call it a religion when it's got nothing supernatural, no praying to gods, no devotion to ancient texts. So it's a really kind of a unique thing. A lot of people, some people call it a life stance, their humanist values. And I think that's a not a bad fit because it's a broad spectrum worldview opportunity. For humanists, I think it really rests on three pillars. One being the pillar of reason and science. This is where we get our knowledge. This is our epistemology. This is what we accept is true or not true based on studies, based on evidence, not based on divine revelation or ancient texts. That's a key pillar. 
But also I think is important is something that flows from empathy, I think, to some degree, which is compassion for others. And also flowing from empathy is egalitarianism. You know, we have the sense that we're all basically equal here and that we all have a chance to do good in the world and that we shouldn't be discriminating against people just because of their group status. And I think those three pillars from them, you can kind of come to any of the progressive humanist values that are espoused by either the American Humanist Association, American Ethical Union, and the other groups that are out there doing the good work. It's interesting when you eliminate this sort of distraction, these supernatural distractions. I mean, I come out of a culture where, oh, we need to solve the world's problems, world hunger or suffering, or you know, we need to see our government agents, politicians, world leaders doing this or that. You know, we just drop to your knees, you say a prayer, dear Lord, please help the people. And we sort of told ourselves that we've made a difference. And uh, one thing I like about your definition of humanism is that it, uh, it embraces the idea that, you know, if anyone's going to solve our problems, it's got to be us. I also have other people who tell me, why does it matter what people believe? And I always say, well, beliefs ripple out as actions, right? It's someone's belief that keeps them from vaccinating their children during a pandemic. It's their belief that causes them to construct foreign policy about places like Israel, It's a belief that causes parents to frighten children with eternal damnation and hellfire. It's it's belief that causes tribal walls to go up, other religions, sexual identities, nations, etc. I mean, you know, I think beliefs matter. And I'm all about rooting ourselves in the real world. And, And so I really like the fact that AHA has a focus on planting our feet right here on terra firma. Definitely. I think that there are groups out there and, you know, I don't, that they do good work that too, but that focus on, well, only what you do matters. It doesn't matter what you believe. And I think, you know, there's validity to that. You're doing good work. Everyone's getting along. We're trying to make the world better. That's nice. But it has a slippery slope effect in my experience. People who don't ground their actions in a firm set of ethical and reason-based foundation of beliefs can easily slip into prejudices, into societal biases can easily go to places where they shouldn't go. Just thinking that, oh, well, this is the modern trend. This is my knee-jerk ideology. I must follow it. Without having that foundation in reason and science and and, uh, doing good in this world, it's open to a lot of dangers. And so that's why I think humanism is so important. Would you as a sociologist agree with the uh, claim that apocalyptic thinking that is rooted in religion has fueled the QAnon phenomenon? I mean, if you're already primed to see everything in terms of the end of days and everything is a conspiracy and it's the light versus the dark, then it's probably easier to sell a QAnon story to somebody like that, right? Yeah, I'm afraid so. And, you know, we have more reason to think that some sort of apocalyptic things can happen. I mean, there's no surprise that, I mean, I know when just a couple of decades ago, post-apocalyptic fiction and stories where, you know, you'd see them once in a while, Margaret Atwood and, you know, others trying these things out. But today it's almost the norm is almost every fictional story is post-apocalyptic because we feel like there's so many ways we can go. (laughs) I remember uh, they had a bunch of Frank Peretti books when I was a believer that came out. It was all about the end times, you know, this sort of action movie about the apocalypse kind of thing. And those things are reflections of society, popular fiction and popular stories and movies. These are reflections about what we're seeing and what our fears are. And I think they are fueling the fire for the religious right and the uh, ultra conservatives. You've got a new book just released. It's called Justice Centered Humanism, How and Why to Engage in Public Policy for Good Humanism in Practice. Uh, The paperback just came out in April of this year. You can find that on Amazon, and I'll link it in the description box. Talk to me about the book, Justice-Centered Humanism. What do you mean? Well, humanism today has to embrace a broad spectrum of issues if we're going to raise our sights and get beyond where we've been in the past. And so one of the things that is on my mind is how do we make the most change possible? And I explore in the book a bunch of different possibilities. And, you know, there are lots of ways we can make change in the world through education and teaching, through um, working with others and in radical ideas. But I feel like public policy is the way you really make the needle move in a way that can be solidified and lasting for generations. And so 
that's what I'm advocating for in the book. And then I go into a lot of different social justice issues in depth as to why we might see this as a humanist issue, what the background is on this issue, how we can make a difference on the issue, where we can find the information to decide for ourselves what the right positions are. And I also talk a little bit about the politicians that we can support who are making this kind of change. And I, I have a special uh, highlight on uh, Representative Jamie Raskin, who's done so much good for humanism, both at the state level in Maryland, where he, he came from, and as, as a representative in the House now today. Interesting to see that uh, someone who embraces humanism is involved in the halls of government. You know, people have asked me, do you think we'll ever see an atheist president? And of course, my first response is, oh, we've had an atheist president. They just knew better <laughs> than to commit political suicide, right? But the normalization of the atheist and or humanist at the highest levels of government, I'd like to think we'll see that in our lifetime. And I think Raskin and others are paving the way, right? Absolutely. It's happening faster than people realize, even on the, especially on the Hill, you know, where some folks still think it might be political suicide, but we've done some surveys. And if you're, uh, have you happened to be a Democrat who is pro-choice and pro-LGBT rights? If you then say, by the way, I happen to be an atheist, it has almost zero effect on your electorate, according to our survey work. And so there is folks who can come out and be open about it. Uh, Representative Huffman from California is uh, very open about his non-theism and humanism and is co-chairs with, along with Representative Raskin of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which is something I go into, I think, for the very first time, a uh, great deal of depth as to how that came to be, who said what, how it happened in the book, uh, Justice-Centered Humanism, I go into that as well. It's interesting for a guy who hosts a show with atheist in the title. I'm not really an atheist first. I, I'd like to think <laughs> I'm a humanist. I've come to the point where I, I'm like, I'm a humanist first. Like, I, I don't believe in gods does not really define anything else about me. And some people get irritated with me when I talk about social uh -huh. justice issues because they hear the word social justice and they immediately flip out and they get into the SJW and they get into all right. the other. I mean, I just, I just want to just everybody take a breath. Everybody stop. And let's talk about essentially what is humanism, right? The rights yeah. of our fellow human beings to live in this world, to have the basic rights that we do, to have human dignity, to have the opportunities that we do. I was shocked to uh, come to the realization, you know, not all atheists are humanists. <laughs> you know right. <laughs> You know, that was a revelation. Well, I was so ignorant, so naive. Well, Karl Rove is popularly a atheist. Um, <laughs> no way. Rove yeah. is an atheist? That's yeah, and he, um, you know, there, there are folks who are objectivists who believe, you know, very strict, rigid interpretations of society who are atheists. I think it is an important part of who we are. I think atheism does lean one automatically a bit toward humanism, yeah. but it doesn't make one a humanist. Yeah, it opens the door, certainly, if I don't have all the other baggage, if I'm not looking through the <laughs> religious lens, kind of a distorted lens to right. root myself in reality, I think it is a lot more natural to begin to find human-to-human -human solutions in this very real world. So I, I take your point. Uh, the book, Justice-Centered Humanism, How and Why to Engage in Public Policy for Good. Humanism in Practice, that's a phrase I like. You know, we can talk about it. Let's try to get out and do it. How can we help you, man? How can we help the uh, American Humanist Association and the cause in general? I think getting involved, whether you're getting involved online or whether you're seeking to support and become a member, that's terrific. Get involved in the local groups. There's hundreds across the country you can join. These things matter and the numbers matter. And when we go into the halls of justice and say, hey, we represent this community and these numbers, they listen. And uh, they're, they're, they're very, very interested in the small amount of support. One thing, one little tidbit that I learned in the political halls is that a little bit of support goes a long way. If somebody gives a small amount of campaign contribution directly to a candidate, they're in a very small percentage of people in that constituency base and they get listened to. <laughs> mm. uh, so a small donation doesn't have to be big. You don't have to give millions. You don't have to give thousands. You could give hundreds and they, they care a lot. <laughs> and it's not because they're so desperate for money. They want to do the right thing. And they want to know that there are people out there who can support them doing the right thing. So I think that's something to keep in mind. I think we're becoming uh, a much too great or much too numerous demographic to ignore, certainly. Right. 
We have to let them know that we are here and we are watching and we are listening and we are interested. My hope is we will be interested and engaged. I know the American Humanist Association is on a day-by-day basis. The website, AmericanHumanist.org. And Roy Speckhardt, the executive director of the AHA. An honor to speak with you. Thank you so much for your work. Let's talk soon, okay? Terrific. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com. 